Welcome back. I'm joined by Ryan McDonald, a Cambridge PhD student who's made it down to the last 100 applicants for the Mars One space programme. The mission to create the first human colony on Mars will blast off in 2026. Thanks so much for coming in, Ryan. Ah, absolutely. My pleasure. Glad to be here. So you must get asked this all the time, but why do you want a one-way ticket to Mars? Well, as far as I see it, you can achieve so much more by going on a one-way ticket to Mars than you can just by doing the traditional return mission. Instead of going there, collecting some rock samples and bringing them back to the Earth, which would be fascinating incidentally, we can go there and establish a lasting human presence there and have a permanent human research outpost on the surface of Mars. And that would be so much more exciting and so much more inspirational for young people all around the world. So it makes absolute sense to me. It is really groundbreaking, of course, it's never happened before. What's the main aim of the mission? Well, the main aim ultimately is to make ourselves go from a stage of just visiting other worlds to staying on them and becoming a multiplanetary species. And ultimately, in the very, very, very long term future, Mars is the most habitable planet in our solar system apart from the Earth. And so it's a place we can really imagine living and making a home there. And so that's exactly what we're planning to do. And of course, this is something you've been wanting to do for a long time, travelling into space. Um, but what sort of first inspired you to sign up for the programme? Well, so, um, I mean, I, I say I've, I've been fascinated by space for really as long as I can remember. Mm. But if there was one real big motivating event for me, it was having the chance to meet Tim Peake back at the launch of the UK Space Agency in 2010. Mm. Because here was, there you a, are. here was a British person <laughs> selected to train to really be an astronaut for the European Space Agency. And it signalled really a change in approach of the UK government to actively supporting human spaceflight. So that's when I really believed it was possible to realise my dream. So mm -hmm. I set off to prepare, go down an academic route, go on and do a PhD, so that I could hopefully apply for ESA the next time they would open up. Mars One just came about and offered me a chance to fulfil my dreams much, much sooner. Yes, of course. And speaking of Tim Peake, of course, he's out at the International Space Station now and schools across the country have been following him really closely, building their projects around it. And you yourself are doing a lot of outreach work, aren't you? What, what have you been doing? Oh, well, uh, so I've gone into schools um, around the world. Well, so obviously here in the UK a lot, but I've gone over to New Zealand, the United States, and also I regularly Skype schools in Canada, for instance. So this is a school in Lincoln that I went to visit who were working on their own Mars One inspired exhibition, for instance. Yeah. And so it really highlights the incredible educational potential of space missions as a whole. So I've really been capitalising on my involvement in the Mars One selection process mm. to get young people around the country and the world interested in science, technology, engineering and maths. Yeah, we've, we've seen what Tim Peake's mission has done for uh, awareness about space travel and, and getting children into to science and technology. What, what do you think Mars One could potentially do for school children? Well, seeing people living on the surface of Mars and conducting exciting research like trying to find out if there was past or even present life on Mars will inspire young people to believe that any challenge can be solved mm. if you put your mind towards it and you're determined enough to see it to the end. Mm. And so ultimately it will get people to realise that by pursuing science there is no obstacle that cannot be overcome. So it's my sincere hope that mm. The young people inspired by the Mars One project will go on and tackle the greatest problems that we're going to face right here on the Earth in the 21st century. So I would say that this is a mission for Earth, not necessarily a mission just to go to Mars. Mm. So let, let's come back to the application process. You're down to the last 100, which is fantastic. And it's been a really challenging process up to now. What have you had to overcome to get this far? Well, to this stage, so there's obviously the more traditional job application stages like CV, resume, motivational letter, mm. um, actually a video as well explaining our motivations. Then we had to go through a medical test to show that we were actually physically capable and fit to do this. We then had an interview with the head of the crew selection committee um, who's um, Dr. Norbert Kraft, who's worked for both the Japanese, Russian and the American space agencies. So, um, I mean, that was a fantastic opportunity to speak to him. And so it was a mixture of psychologically profiling questions, examining how our thought process actually works, as well as technical knowledge questions to assess our ability to rapidly apply large quantities of information in an unfamiliar context. But it's only been individual testing up to this point. What comes next is where it gets exciting, and that is the group testing. Of course, and tell me about this. It, it's going to be an isolation period, I understand. Mm. So this September, all the remaining 100 candidates are going to gather at a single location where a simulation mission is going to take place for two weeks. So after going through a period of group challenges, 
we will then spend nine days effectively locked up into a box which will be a replica of the Mars settlement built here on the Earth. And that is really to test how we cope with small groups of four individuals being put under extreme psychological stress. Wow. Because, of course, they're actually looking for a team at the end of it, aren't they? Not, not just an individual. Yeah, I mean, you could be the best individual candidate, but then if you get locked up in a box and you can't cope with the team and you go insane, <laughs> then obviously you're not going to go to Mars. So, and that's what I say at the end of the day, and I've had the chance to meet 26 of the other 100 candidates so far in person. And we all seem to share this mentality in that, I mean, if I'm not the best candidate, then don't send me. The mission has to come first. Mm. So what would you say you, you have to offer to the mission then? Obviously, you said you've, you've built your whole academic career around uh, this goal of going. So, so what special skills and knowledge do you think you can offer? Well, so it's not necessarily the knowledge that you've acquired. It's the ability to gain large amounts of knowledge and proficiency in huge swaths of different skill sets and then being able to apply them rapidly. So for instance, in my academic background, so I did a physics degree over in Oxford and then came over here, now I'm doing a PhD in theoretical astrophysics. Mm -hmm. So the mathematical skills I've developed, the ability to create models and test them, and generally having a mastery of the scientific method and process, that can rapidly be applied to the engineering aspects that will be so vitally required, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I like to think that I can rapidly learn new skills and then actually apply them in the useful context. So We'll have to see ultimately, mm. but um, yeah, I would say that And in addition to that, it's also it's the drive and the determination as well. So I see a goal, I set that goal and then I just charge straight at it and then don't give up until the goal has been realised. So I would say at the end of the day, it's the combination of skills that have been acquired, skills that can be acquired <laughs> and the determination to see them through to fruition. Mm. And hoping that you're successful if you do go out to Mars, what will life be like out there? Because of course we've all seen The Martian. Um, <laughs> how does it compare to that? Well, so people will be pleased to hear that the dust storm that happened in The Martian is, is nowhere near as bad on the real world Mars. In fact, the small little rovers that we have going on the surface, some of them in particular have been running for 10 years actually now, they get the dust blown off their solar panels by the storms and dust devils on Mars. They don't knock things about all the time. It's just not, there's just not enough pressure on Mars mm. to do that. So don't, now don't, get me, don't get me wrong, I mean, life is not going to be easy on Mars. Mm. You have a limited power supply, you have to make your own air, for instance, grow your own food. Mm. So it will be a big, certainly a big hit to my quality of life. But equally, I would say, it will be better than many people's quality of life that we have here on the Earth at the moment. Mm. And it's my sincere hope that people around the world who are watching us living on Mars and overcoming these huge obstacles, if they can see people from maybe four different continents all working together to solve a problem, then they'll look back and think, is there anything that we can't do ourselves? And maybe it'll inspire people to live more sustainably back here on the Earth. Mm. But is there a part of you that is a little bit afraid and not quite ready to, to give up your life here on Earth and never see your friends and, and family again? Well, I mean, it's, it's still a long way off. It's still at least 10 to 12 years or so. And that's obviously if every mission before that goes successful, mm. which delays always happen in aerospace, <laughs> as we uh, see so often. Mm. So I would say that um, lock me up in a box for two weeks in September, see how I cope. And if it turns out that I can't, don't send me. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy either way. I've got a fantastic PhD. Things are going absolutely fantastic for me. And regardless of whether I'm on Earth or whether I'm on Mars, what really motivates me is inspiring young people and science communication. So I'll do that regardless of what planet I'm on. Mm. Oh, that's a really positive attitude towards it. Um, and of course, it all does come back down to this big million dollar question, doesn't it? Will Mars be able to support human life, do you think? Well, so we know that Mars used to be a habitable planet about four billion years ago or so. In fact, all the evidence we're accumulating suggests that it had a large body of liquid water in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm. Now, a good portion of that water is still there on Mars, just frozen beneath the surface, for instance. So we have all of the resources we need locally on Mars to be able to support human life there. And if we're looking forward into the far, far, far future, then using technologies mm. not too dissimilar from what we have today, we could actually deliberately make Mars a habitable planet again in a process called terraforming. So um, we're doing a very good job of warming the Earth, for instance, accidentally. Imagine what we could do if we put our mind towards it. You've got the um, challenge coming up in September, but of course the final number is going to be 24, isn't it? So can you just explain how the mission will work with the final 24? Yes, so following the final parts of the selection process in September, 
six teams of four people will be selected to train for the mission. Mm -hmm. And so this is a long-term training process lasting at least 10 to 12 years or so because it's just such a huge number of skill sets you have to share between you because you're the only people on an alien world. So in amongst each team, which will be two males and two females, mm -hmm. you'll have to share a wide variety of different skill sets. So two of us will specialize in engineering, which would be the stream that I would be going down, and then two would specialize in medicine. In addition to that, you'd have to learn skill sets such as dentistry, astrobiology, space law, for instance, how to obviously grow your own food in the hydroponics. There's just so many different things that you have to learn. And in addition to the technical training, we'll also have personal training with a dedicated psychologist to understand how our mind works so that we can diagnose, for instance, if we're feeling stressed and be open and honest with our crew members. Mm -hmm. And finally, there'll be up to a three month simulation mission every year as part of the training in order to effectively assess us in as accurate a replica of the Mars base as we can, ultimately stepping up in the final years of the training to a simulation mission in Antarctica. Wow, it sounds really exciting and I know there's still a way to go, but uh, I wish you all the best with your challenge coming up in September. Thank you so much for joining me, Ryan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you.